Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the book of 1 Peter. The book of 1 Peter and chapter number 5. The book of 1 Peter chapter number 5. As we're finishing up, just uh, <coughs> two more lessons after this of walking through the book of 1 Peter. We could see that as we're hitting this last chapter, that the Apostle Peter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is trying to give some practicality uh, to the believers that are being written to. Trying to encourage them to survive the upcoming oppression, the upcoming persecutions, the upcoming sufferings, and to give them encouragement, to give them the strength to start living for the Lord now. And as we come to the book of 1 Peter chapter number 5, 1 Peter chapter number 5, Notice with me, if you don't mind, as we hit verse number 1. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 1. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being an examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, notice if you don't mind as we learn about the pastors and the shepherds in First Peter chapter number 5. Notice the instruction to them in verse number 3. Being examples to the flock, being examples to the flock. And with this, we want to see this idea that the Bible puts here of the pastor, of the pastor. As we come to this, we could see and just remind it about uh, Peter. Remember that Peter in his life, he was a fisherman. He was a rugged fisherman who lived on the seas, had his own business. He was successful in life. But God had called him to follow after Jesus Christ. And as he had followed Jesus Christ, God had trained him, prepared him, and led him to be the leaders of the early church and to to be an example for others. And now as he has been taught, he is now entering, entering in the last part of his ministry with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's writing with the idea of trying to encourage the church, trying to give them some last minute things to be a blessing to this church. And with this, we understand one of the gifts that God gave to the church, uh, Ephesians chapter 4 as a reference, but look with me in 1 Peter chapter number 5, we could see some things about the pastor, about the pastor. The first thing we want to kind of examine here is the meaning of the pastor. The meaning of the pastor. Inside of the Bible, in the New Testament, it refers to pastor and it uses several synonyms. What's a synonym? Something that means the same. Something that means the same thing. And inside of the Word of God, there are three synonyms that refer to the same office, but they have different synonyms to try to describe the different aspects of that office. And this is the office of the pastor. And the three synonyms is the pastor shepherd. That's the same idea, the pastor shepherd. There's the idea of an elder, which carries the idea of being spiritually mature. I'll kind of define these further in just a bit. And the idea of a bishop. That's still the idea of a pastor. It means overseer. And each one of these speak about the different office of the pastor and the different aspects of the pastor. With that in mind, let's see what the Bible has to say in 1 Peter chapter number 5 and see these different aspects of the pastor and how the pastor is supposed to be a help to the church to help strengthen them up for the days to come. Notice with me in verse number 1, chapter 5 verse 1. The elders 
which are among you I exhort, which also an elder, a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. As we see this meaning of the pastor, the first word we come up to is this idea of an elder. The word elder carries the idea of someone who's spiritually mature. Someone who's spiritually mature. Now, we know that we age... <laughs> a certain way physically, but there are some people who age differently spiritually. That you could be a younger person and still be spiritually mature. And so here we're not talking about physical age. We do hope that the people as they get older and longer in the tooth, that they do become wiser and hopefully spiritually mature, but that's not always the case. In this case, it's dealing with the idea that a pastor should be spiritually mature. In opposition to that, in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3, we're not looking there, part of the qualifications of a pastor is that he's not a novice. The idea of novice is someone who is new, entering in, green, someone who doesn't have a spiritual maturity. In fact, as a pastor, there's a requirement to be spiritually mature. Why is that? Well, as a matter of practice and observation, the people will not grow spiritually past where their pastor is. Meaning, if their pastor grows to this level, most of the church people will not surpass that level. And so there needs to be a spiritual maturity. The, as long as the pastor is still growing, the congregation can still be growing. Does that make sense? Yes. And that there needs to be a spiritual maturity so that way he could impart and encourage. We're going to cover why this is important in just a little bit about the manner of the pastor. But we could see that he has to start off that he has to be someone that's spiritually mature because he's dealing with spiritual problems and spiritual things to help people to grow spiritually. The idea of an elder is someone who is spiritually mature. As we go on, we can see something else here. It says, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither being lords of God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. In this, we see the second idea here, feed the flock of God, which carries the idea of a pastor shepherd. It carries the idea of the shepherd guarding, protecting, watching over the sheep. In fact, the idea and the picture of the shepherd and the sheep is God's favorite illustration for his relationship with us. That he deals with us as a shepherd while we are the sheep. Now, as we take a look at the shepherd, we have to also look at the sheep. In the Bible, it calls us sheep quite a bit. Why does he call us sheep? Well, if you've ever done a study of sheep, we learn a couple things. First of all, they're dumb. They are dumb. <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> they are a type of creature that doesn't learn their lesson. For example, quite often, a sheep will look over a ledge and say, hey, I think there's something green down there. I'm going to go get it and fall off the ledge. And now he's stuck on the ledge bah, and helpless and he can't get back up. And so the shepherd takes his shepherd's crook, a special staff that has a little hook around it. He hooks the the sheep and pulls them back up. Don't do that again. Ah, and runs off and plays. Later on, that same sheep will go to that same ledge, look over. Hey, there's something green down there. I think I want something. And he'll go and pick it up and then he's stuck. Bah, bah, and the shepherd has to pull him back up again. And the, sh the sheep will continue to do it over and over again until the shepherd interferes, interferes, does something different. What does the shepherd do to stop that? Well, the shepherd breaks the leg of the sheep. So that way he can't walk. But then the shepherd doesn't leave him around. The shepherd actually will carry the sheep on his shoulders everywhere he goes until that leg is healed. And by that time, the sheep, the sheep won't go and fall off the ledge anymore. That's part of shepherding is taking care of the people, helping watch over them. Sheep are dumb. Um, recent events, I think uh, 15, 10, 15 years ago, and uh, in Turkey, there was a bunch of shepherds that had a big flock of thousands. And the shepherds decided they were going to go have breakfast together. And so they kind of left the flock. And as they were having breakfast together, one of the sheep looked over a ledge and said, hey, that something looks cool and dropped off a hundred foot cliff. Well, the rest of the sheep followed him. All of them. And hundreds of sheep died. 
and uh, hundreds other were injured as they just parted piling on each other. And you think one of them say, hey, wait a second. But no, they just all followed with them. Sheep are dumb. By the way, as we work with God, we're dumb too. God looks at us. If God could face palm, he'd probably face palm us, right? Oh, what, again? Why? We just covered this. I don't know. You ever ask a kid, you know, why'd you do it? And they look at him, I don't know. Sometimes it's an honest answer. I don't know why I did it. We do the same thing. God, why'd you do that? I don't know. It looked cool at the time. Why'd you do that? I don't know. We're dumb. And that's why God calls sheep dumb. But the shepherd's job is not just to feed him, but they're supposed to take care, guard the flock, protect the flock, protect it from themselves, lead them, make sure they have good grass to eat. There's all kinds of things dealing with that idea of a shepherding. And God has given a pastor to help shepherd the sheep, to guard them, to protect them, to feed them, to give them what they need, to watch out for them. There's a lot involved in there. That's why God says, feed the flock of God. But notice the next phrase in here in verse number two. Feed the flock of God which is among you, um, taking the oversight thereof. The third word that is a synonym for a pastor, we have elder, pastor, shepherd, and bishop. The word bishop is not a term that carries the idea of someone who oversees many pastors and flocks. That's something that's been changed over time. A bishop in the Bible is the same office of a pastor and it carries the idea of an overseer, someone who's in charge. And after all, someone has to be in charge. Someone has to help make sure the bills are get paid. You know, one thing about people is that they don't, they want the authority, but they don't like the responsibility. Amen. It's nice to tell people what to do, but when it comes time to be responsible, nobody likes that job. Well, someone has to. Hey, did the electric bill get paid? I don't know. Someone's got to make sure that it gets paid. Someone has to make sure that things are taken care of. That's the idea of taking the oversight thereof is overseeing, making sure that things are taken care of, making sure that things are solved. Someone's got to uh, take the responsibility. That's the idea of a bishop, same offices of a pastor. So they're talking about three the same office, but three aspects of the same office. Three different responsibilities. Someone who's spiritually mature to help lead people to maturity. Someone who's a shepherd who's going to care for the flock. Love the flock. Take care of them. Feed them. Give them what they need. And then the idea of a bishop. Someone who's making sure that things are taken care of. Bills are getting paid. Things are getting taken up. People are being visited. This is being solved. Someone has to be in charge. That's what it's taking here. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Not <laughs> for filthy lucre's sake, but of a ready mind. Neither being lords over the heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Notice where it says here, taking the example. Taking the example. This here carries the idea that we are to be examples. Remember when you had um, school and they had the example inside of your test, maybe a math problem, and they would show you how to do it? An example is just a quick little sampling. An example is a pattern to follow for life. And part of being the pastor is being a spiritual example that people can follow with their lives. Paul said, follow me as I follow after Christ. That some, we mostly need a physical example of what we're supposed to follow, what we're supposed to be like, what we're supposed to behave like. And that a pastor is supposed to be that example, in example, to follow, someone could pattern their life after. I'm supposed to treat people like this. Not only how do I preach, but how do I work with people? Do I yell at people? Do I get in traffic and lose my temper like everyone else, you know, and blow a gasket? What is the example that we're supposed to live like? The pastor is supposed to be that pattern to follow. So we talked about the meaning of the pastor. Now let's talk about the manner of the pastor. The manner of the pastor. What do we see here? Now again, it says, neither being, um, verse number two, 
Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre's sake, but of a ready mind. Neither being lords over God's heritage, but being an example to the flock. What we see here is that the pastor here is supposed to lead the flock. He's supposed to go over them, not supposed to be the Lord over their heritage. Now with this, um, we'll give, um, we'll cover this first. Inside of a Baptistic church, there are usually three types of church polity or church government. First of all, there is a congregational ruled A congregation ruled. In this, the congregation has the power and then they have to vote for everything. All right, can we buy toilet paper this week? Let's take a vote. And there are some that are congregational ruled. They're the ones who pick the Sunday school teacher. They're the ones in charge. Another example of a church uh, polity government inside of of a Baptistic church is a pastor ruled Uh, government. That carries the idea that the pastor is the end-all be-all. And in that, I've seen some pastors go so far that they say, listen here, you don't pick out a car without telling me, asking me so I could figure out what color you should have. Well, that's pastor ruled and everything lives and dies by him. Then there's a third type of church polity inside of Baptistic churches, which is the idea of a pastor-led church. Inside of a pastor-led church, the pastor leads the flock and says, all right, this is what I believe the Lord would have us to do. I want you to go to the Lord yourself, and I want you to be convinced this is what God has us to do. So that way they're not just following the pastor, but they're following God and they're going together. He's just leading them how they should follow after the Lord. And so with this, we could see inside of the Bible here, what type of church polity we should have. In 1 Peter chapter number 5, in verse 3, it says, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples. Here it talks about that they're supposed to lead. Inside of um, the Bible, we have this example. Inside of the book of Exodus, we have the Pharaoh and the Egyptians driving the flock with whips and hia and go. And then after that, we have Moses who is leading the people of God by him leading and say, let's follow God together. Even today, we have a difference between a Western shepherd and an Eastern shepherd. In the Western shepherd, the cowboys and whatnot, we have cattle drives. We are driving the flock. We're behind them. Hia, hia. Whereas the Eastern shepherd, the shepherd leads and the sheep will follow after the shepherd. This is the type of example that God has given to us that we're supposed to lead the flock. That here, guys, you go follow the Lord. And as I follow God, let's go together. That carries this same idea. By the way, just as gee whiz information, when our country was being founded and they found out that the Articles of Confederation didn't work, George Washington, uh, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, whatnot, happened to show up to a Baptist church. And as they showed up to a Baptist church, they looked and said, this is amazing that the congregation had voted for a pastor and then they willingly submitted to his authority. And they said, this is great. And so they had patterned our government after the same thing, that we vote after a leader and then we willingly submit to his leadership afterwards. Where did that come from? That was from the example that God had first put of how to do things that we're supposed to lead and have the people go on. So we could see the manner of the pastor. Then finally, we find the motive of the pastor. As we're in 1 Peter chapter 5, and we're examining this book of 1 Peter, we now see as God is taking time to explain the shepherd, remember that the book of 1 Peter is dealing with the idea that persecution and suffering and hardship is right around the corner, that God is trying to prepare us to start living like Christians now while we have the freedom, before the persecution happens. And as we're hitting this 
part of 1 Peter, we're seeing that God has given us a tool, something to help us by giving a pastor to try to be an encouragement, to try to be a help, to try to be a blessing to the flock, to help them as they follow after the Lord. We see the motive of the pastor here, once again in verse number 2, 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 2, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. What is the motive of the pastor? Well, first of all, he says it's not for money. The word filthy lucre carries the idea of having money as your motive. Any Baptistic pastor that's in it for the money is in it in the wrong business. Amen. That <laughs> we're not in it for the money. We're doing it because we're supposed to follow after the Lord. Now, there is a responsibility to take care of the pastor, but may I also kind of, it may be semantics, but you don't pay a pastor to preach. There's not enough money in the world. What you do do is help take care of his finances so he is free to follow after God's will. Does that make sense? There's a distinction there that they try to take care of his finances. Otherwise, it would get to the place where people say, listen, I pay your salary. You better preach what I say. After all, that's the golden rule that whoever has the gold makes the rules. That the pastor is supposed to feel free to follow whatever God tells him to do. And as the congregation just takes care of his finances, so he's free to follow what God's given to do. But he's not in it for the money. He shouldn't be in it for the money. It's the wrong motive. What is the right motive of the pastor? Verse number four. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. What is the motive? The motive is Christ. Knowing that I'm going to stand before him. That as a pastor, it's not my church, the personal pronoun. It's not my church. It's God's church. I'm just set to be steward over. And because it's his church, and as a steward, I have to give account to my boss of how well I treat it what was his. My motive should be Christ, knowing that I'm going to stand before him. In fact, let me show you this in the book of Hebrews chapter number 13. The book of Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, in the book of Hebrews in this section here, it's giving a practicality to people since they see that Christ is better than all of these other things. How are we supposed to respond? In the book of Hebrews chapter 13, Notice with me in verse 17. Hebrews 13 and verse 17. It says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. So as he's talking to the folks at that age, he's saying, all right, you are to obey them that have the rule over you. By the way, verse 7 clarifies who has the rule over you. It's in this context, an idea of a pastor. So obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Remember the word submit carries the idea that it is a heart issue. That there's a difference between being compliant and being submissive. I'll give an example. As a teenager, you could be told, go clean your room. And the teenager, <laughs> and they go clean their room. They may have technically obeyed, but were they submitted? No. Not at all. Because submission comes with a heart. Remember, when you agree with leadership, that's called unity. That's what we want. When we disagree with unity, that's where submission comes in. Where we willingly submit ourselves to the authority that God has given to us with our heart. By the way, that's hard. That's what we all struggle with. Is submitting not my will, but your will, God. And submitting unto that authority. So in this passage, it says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Now notice the next word. The word for. Remember inside of the Bible in English language, whenever you see the word for, you could often ask the question why. So remember when you're talking to a little kid or a teenager and you tell them to go do something, their normal question is why? Right? So if they come up to you and say, Dad, can I borrow the keys to the car? And you tell them no, they say, why? why? Now, oftentimes they're not asking for information. They're just trying to get you to change your mind. Because if you said yes, they wouldn't say why to that. They would be outside of the parking lot and squealing off before you finish the last syllable of S. <laughs> 
Now, here it says, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. And God's almost imagining in their mind that as he's dealing with them, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. And somebody looks at God and says, why? Why? Why should I obey? God's pre had already had this in mind and so he answers the question. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Why? For they watch for your souls. This is that idea of shepherding. That they're watching over you. They're trying to take care of you. They're trying to watch out for you. The biggest heartbreak of the ministry is wanting more for people than what they want for themselves. Trying to guard them and protect them. This is not the right way. I want to help you. Please read your Bible. Please. I'm trying to protect you. The, the bridge is out up there. I'm trying to warn you. Don't go that direction. If I could give a small cheap illustration. Um, in my military days, I was a lab tech and part of being a lab tech was to be a phlebotomist where uh, we drew blood. Actually, they just paid me to stab people. It was great. And uh, <laughs> when we would draw blood as a phlebotomist, I would get to the place where I can know that's going to bleed or that's not going to bleed. And so there were times that I said, all right, what you need to do is hold pressure, put your hand up, don't bend your arm, just hold it straight up. It's going to bleed. And sometimes I would have someone look at me and say, listen, I know my body, it's not going to be bleed, it is going to be fine. Okay. And so they walk away. A couple minutes later, they're holding their arm, blood is all over, it's all over the floor, and they come to me, and guess who gets to clean up the mess? Well, if they listened to me in the first place, there would be no mess. Well, pastoring's the same way. I try to encourage, don't do that, don't go that way, that's the wrong way. I know myself, I'm fine. And they come back a couple minutes later and there's a mess to be cleaned up. Pastor, can you help me? Well, that's pastoring. The biggest heartbreak of the ministry is wanting more for people than what they want for themselves. So it says, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Why? For they watch over your souls. But notice it goes on some more. As they must give an account. By the way, who do I give an account to? To the Lord. As a pastor, part of my responsibility is not only to watch over, to feed the flock, to guard the flock, to help be the example, to encourage them, to give them what they need to do, but I also have to stand and give an account to God. Why? Because it's not my sheep, it's his sheep. It's not my church, it's his church. I have to give an account. What do I give account for? Well, as a pastor, I don't give an account for your actions. You're responsible for your actions. What I am responsible for is what is being taught and who is teaching. I'm responsible for what information is going out. So if somebody is teaching wrong, guess who's responsible for that? I am. I'm responsible for the Sunday school teachers. I'm I have to give an account what is being taught? What is being helped? What's not being taught? That's the responsibility. And I have to stand before God and give an account. That's a heavy responsibility. Notice as it goes on some more in verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls. As they must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief. Again, the biggest heartbreak of the ministry is wanting more for people than what they want for themselves. May I give you a little secret? A pastor who's a true shepherd, he goes to sleep thinking about people. He wakes up thinking about people. He wakes up in the middle of the night praying for people. People are on his mind. People's on a heart. Oh no, this marriage here, it's having some problems. What do I say? How do I encourage? Oh, these people over here, they're hurting. This family just died. How do I help them? How do I comfort them? Lord, give me wisdom. That's on their mind the entire time. It's people. And when the sheep and the people in the congregation is being obedient, thank you, pastor, we're reading our Bible, we're growing in the Lord. That's fun. Woohoo, that's great. Let's do happy stuff. Let's go. But when people are not obeying and you watch as children are failing and marriages are failing and you're watching where they're going, that's the heartbreak. Now the pastor is waking up with it and he's crying himself at sleep at night and saying, Lord, please protect them. Lord, help them make the right decision. Lord, guard them. Watch over them. Notice it says, for that is unprofitable to you. Why don't you want your pastor brokenhearted? Because it's not profitable to you. 
a pastor who's brokenhearted, that's not going to be a much of a help when he's trying to say, Lord, come on, guys, come on, guys. That pressure and that thing, it doesn't help people. You, when pastor's happy, then you guys are doing well. It works well together. And so here we could see the motive of the pastor. The motive of the pastor is he's not in it for the money. He's in it to obey the Lord and follow after the Lord and try to be a help and try to be an encouragement to them. All of this is helping to strengthen us for the things yet to come. That is the pastor saying, God says persecution's around the corner. Do you see the things as a persecution around the corner? Now's the time to start developing the habit of obedience to Christ. Don't wait till it's too late. Don't wait till they outlaw the Bible before you start saying, I'm going to read my Bible. Read your Bible now. Don't wait until they start outlawing going to church. Be in the habit of going to church now. Start trying to follow after the Lord now. It's part of what the pastor's job is. He's the cheerleader. Come on, guys, you can do it. Come on, we're for you. Let's go. We love you. Now, again, I know for a lot of pastors, it's hard to talk about the pastor because we're not trying to promote ourselves. However, we have to preach what the Bible says and give you an understanding of what my role is. Some people believe that the pastor only works three times a week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. The rest of it, he just does nothing. The people need to be understanding that there's more to them than not. There's studying, there's visiting, there's praying, there's caring for the flock, there's all of these other things that go alongside with it. And people <laughs> have the instruction. Now, our church knows, anybody who's been here knows that I'm a workaholic and that working is not the problem that we have here. That we're laboring and we're working and seeing things done and watching things get accomplished. And we do have a wonderful Savior. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 Five three zero six three zero eight. Once again, that number is nine two zero five three zero six three zero eight. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.